this podcast could potentially have adult language, adult themes, definitely drinking, and possibly the possibility of sexual content. <clears throat> Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Drinking with Authors, the podcast. I am your host, Erica Lance. My amazing co-host today is Mark Muncy from Erie Travels. And our guest today is Jessica Salina. Woo! <clears throat> Welcome, Jessica. Wow, Hi. I did that to myself. I have a little bit of a cold. So thank you, my lovely granddaughter, Parker. She turned one and gave me her cold, which was my present from her. Um, let's talk about what we're drinking, shall we? So in the spirit of having a cold and wanting to at least sleep it off, I actually got a little fancy today and I mixed um, apple juice with whiskey and cinnamon because that's it's it's healthy, right? Like I yeah. wish I had apple cider, but I only had apple juice. So it, anyway, it's it, fruit. You got that vitamin C. <laughs> Yeah, lots of vitamin C. This is very healthy. No, we don't say things are healthy here because people can't take our advice. Okay, Mark, what are you drinking? Uh, I am uh, sticking with the theme since it's a little chilly down here in Florida and we're dodging falling iguanas this week. Uh, I'm sticking with some hot coffee. And since I am the designated driver, uh, I am using co our wonderful friends at uh, Coffee Shop of Horrors, the Ichabod's Dame. I'm finishing off the pumpkin, living my Halloween. So happy Halloween. I love that. I love that since it's the middle of January. Then mm -hmm. Okay. Jessica, your drink looked incredibly fancy when you held it up before. What are you drinking? Don't be fooled. It's just a smoothie. So I actually don't drink alcohol. So I was like, I'll just treat myself to a nice little fruit smoothie and a fancy glass that we got from one of the restaurants at Disney Springs. So it's just got some strawberries, some banana, raspberry, and Greek yogurt. So that is that is way fancier than the rest of us. So well done with that. Okay, Jessica, for those who may not be familiar with you, what do you write? Yeah, so my debut novel actually comes out at the time of this recording this week on January 19th. It's a superhero romance. So I grew up a huge fan of superheroes. I saw the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man when I was eight in theaters and it changed my brain chemistry forever. Uh, more specifically, that upside down kiss scene with him and Mary Jane, it's very famous. And um, clearly my tastes haven't changed much. So now I write uh, romance novels about superheroes and their love interests. Wonderful. And what is the title of this new release? It's called Not My Time, the first in River Peak Heroes. I love that. I love that. So what got you started? Um, now, I know because I have insider information that you um, write for your day job as well. Yeah. I act like I have big spy secrets. I do not, but <laughs> I could. I could have made it sound. He is that the way. master of whispers. Don't let her. Don't let her <laughs> lie like that. So I am. I'm, I am totally the spider in Game of Thrones. That's <laughs> up until the last season. Don't get me started on that. We don't um, talk about that season. It didn't happen. We, we don't. What that season? season didn't exist. I'm still waiting for it. So. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so what, uh, when did you decide you wanted to write though? So I first decided I wanted to write when I was actually a little kid. So when I was in kindergarten, we actually had this like little exercise that we had to do in this like little booklet that was like, my name is Jessica. I like cats, like random cute little stuff like that that you have kindergartners do. And one of the pages on it was when I grow up, I want to be, and I actually wrote an author because I grew up loving reading. So I guess I've just always known <laughs> And then I went to school for journalism and I actually got my career started in news and then shifted into digital marketing and uh, NaNoWriMo in 2021. I was like, you know what? Let's give this novel writing thing a try because I've always wanted to do it. <laughs> That's very cool. So um, had you before that you hadn't written any fiction? Fan fiction, yes. I'm admitting Ooh, that. To let's the talk now. about fan fiction. I'm admitting <laughs> that to the public now. The whole world knows. But um, yeah, so I used to write a lot of fanfic back in the day. I actually wrote a lot of Star Wars fan fiction uh, back in like 2015 when Force Awakens came out. Was my whole thing. I will never share what I wrote, uh, and I think most of it's wiped from the internet now, anyway. But 
Uh, the real ones, no. <laughs> what were the characters, at least? You got to at least share that part. What characters did you? I wrote a lot of Kylo Ren fan fiction, believe it or not. Well, I, got I believe of, that. I, I, I think I just radiate that energy. But um, <laughs> he's very popular to this day. So very, nice. very, very cool. So um, how much fan fiction did you write? Oh, God. I mean, I started... I think my first introduction was around the time I was like probably in like middle school you know a lot of like fanfiction.net Quizilla had a lot of fanfiction that site doesn't even exist anymore rest in peace um so was introduced to a lot of like Percy Jackson fanfiction supernatural fanfiction on a lot of these websites and that was kind of how I was like oh this is a thing and when I was around 13 14 I started trying to write it myself and it was as cringy as a 13 or 14 year old's supernatural fan fiction would be, but <laughs> we grow, right? <laughs> hey, at least you started uh, sharpening your teeth on something at that age yeah. versus yep. starting to write it when you're 27 or something like that. And then being <laughs> like, so it was cringy 27 year old fan fiction. Right. <laughs> I, I got out of my system. <laughs> yeah. Whenever you start, it's cringy, you know? Yeah. That's oh, yeah. Hey, 50 year old fan fiction is still good too. Just saying. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Mark, are you writing fan fiction now? I I I'm I, I refuse to I plead the fifth. I'm gonna sip some coffee. I mean, hey, I, <laughs> I spilled. So I'm on deadline for three projects. Uh so I can't say yes, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you gave up way too much in that statement. <laughs> we will come back to that. Jessica, this is about, about Jessica. Jessica. We'll do that another but time. You better hope this whiskey kicks in. Is all I'm going to say, my dude. <laughs> dude. Okay. I'm not in the hot seat tonight. So. Yeah, exactly. And you put yourself there. Nobody put like, you there. Like went to the hot seat. You're like I am the worst at keeping secrets. That's why I'm terrible with NDAs because I just I'm, you know. You're like, let me tell you all the things. Yeah. Okay, so besides Mark now revealing so many secrets on this show, <laughs> uh, so what made you finally really, for, <clears throat> and you took on NaNoWriMo, which is huge, and I think it's fantastic, but that's a huge, like, write a novel in a month, and people are like, I'm going to write a novel in a month, and I'm like, oh, my, my, my friends, what you are taking on there. Yeah. So what made you decide to finally bite the bullet? Had the story sort of been swirling? It had been for a few months. I actually, not that long ago, found the original, like, first draft concept of what would later become, actually not my time sequel was what I started with, and I ended up flipping the order, um, because as I was writing it, I was like, no, I need other stuff to come first, um, but I had about, like, 18, 19,000 words written, and by the time it was getting closer to November, I was like, you know what, let's just, like, do this, like, let's commit let's just get it done. It's, um, and at the time I had actually recently cut out, you know, some toxic people in my life. And I was going on this sort of like self-discovery journey in the process. My husband was very supportive and he was like, you know what, just do it. Like get it all out there and let's just do it. And I was like, you know what? Yeah. Because now I don't have people that I was worried about their opinion now in the back of my head gone. So I was like, there's no more like fear factor so screw it let's just go for it and i'm so glad i did because <laughs> now we're here that's very cool so and i just keep got in i'm very sorry about that um and not sorry because that helped with my throat a little bit so i don't cough my brains out um so how much did you write that november did you write the entire first draft of the book in november yeah so i had i think my total was 19k because I remember I was like okay I need to get 15 or 50,000 words and my husband and I had a moment he looked at me and he's like you know that if you do this right your first draft end count word goal could be 69 420 and I was like well I have to for the funny number I have to yeah so we got it from 19 to the 69 420 and that ended up being the first drafts word count and then I eventually it ended up getting bumped up to around 72 um after I did the first pass of edits so so what was that like for you having a novel in your hands when you got to the end of it? Because you were rushing and that's a little bit different than when some authors that we talk to are like sitting with this for years. You know what I mean? Like 
years and years. I happen to have taken eight years to finish my first novel, you know, wrote many short stories in between, but eight years to finish the first one. So when you sit with it for a really long time, it's very different than when you bang it out like in a month. So what was that like when you when you got to your 69 420? It was kind of surreal because I think it was something that I had always wanted to do. But, you know, like I was saying, like that fear factor was finally gone. So I was like, holy shit, I did this, um, especially quickly. And I think it's the former journalist in me. I work super well under pressure. Um, so having that kind of like deadline of a month, even though there's no real like consequence, right? Like the only consequence is you don't have your 50K done, Um but having that sort of like, okay, I have to get this many done, it provided a really nice structure and sort of this like kind of self-imposed like deadline and urgency that I think really helped me just actually get it done just because that's how I tend to work. So when you're doing this, um, uh, did you do an outline or anything like that? How much world building, how much structure? Because being a journalist, I know uh, from talking to many journalists on the uh, the program. I can't believe I just said the program. Like, hey, the whiskey is you sound all professional it. there. Yeah, yeah. How professional. I'm sounding on the on the program. Um, but having talked to a lot of people that had done journalism before, it's a very different kind of writing. Oh yeah, right. yeah. And that was something that was kind of funny to break out of because you know writing fan fiction and creative writing and stuff in like middle school and a little bit in high school, you know, that's a little more long form. And then going into college and switching gears to journalism and my first few years, I worked at a news station for television, but I was writing the scripts that like the news anchors and the reporters would read. Uh, so you go from like this like long form, very detailed to as short as you can possibly make it for TV, right? Especially to our station had a big emphasis on keeping all the snippets short and fast because I produced for a morning show. So it was people are trying to get as much as they can as they're making their coffee and heading out the door for work. So you're talking 15 seconds or less, you got to tell a whole story. So having to adjust back into that like long form content again, I was like, it feels nice to get back to this, but it's weird, <laughs> especially too, after I left news, it was writing for social media. And only more recently, I feel like has like microblogging where you've got these long captions been is like newer. So again, shorter form at the time when I was doing social media marketing specifically. So it was definitely a little bit of a challenge and I'm glad I got a lot of that out of the way before November because I can't even fathom trying to like start fresh without that and even to this day I need like a pretty rigid outline get all the world building done first because otherwise I just feel lost so how many have you written now so I'm currently writing the fourth in River Peak Heroes so I'm a little ahead uh so the second one's with Four Horsemen's editorial team and then the third is with my beta readers right now. So nice. That is, and you really started in earnest in the fall of 2021. Yeah. And we're in January of 2023. So literally over a year and four months, you've written four books. Pretty much. And I've got a few other um, works in progress is that I have like 10K here, 5K there, 15K here. So just, yeah, I'm the type of person where, when I have the thought, I have to write it down. Otherwise, it's gone forever. So I, I just figure I might as well just write it down. And then I can return to it later, even if it's not my focus, just to get it out. And that adds up over time. Yep. No, it, it does. Okay, we have to take a quick break. And we're, we're going to talk about your writing style, because I think you could give some advice to people out there. We'll be right back. Sample locally sourced, quality distilled spirits in the beautiful Columbia River Gorge. At Skunk Brothers Distillery, we're family owned, brewing small batch grain to bottle spirits, just like our grandfather did back in the Prohibition era. From handcrafted bourbons and moonshine to flavored blends and cordials infused with local fruit. Join us for a tasting tour and buy Skunk Brothers spirits straight from the source. It's all in the family at Skunk Brothers Spirits located in Stevenson, Washington. Okay, so we're back after talking to somebody who wrote basically for full novels in a year yeah. or so um so what how did you I guess you know having experienced it but how did you find sort of your mojo for writing do you write like in the morning at night like 
explain to us your process pretty please <laughs> yeah so i work uh for my day job uh like a nine to five thirty sort of situation so i will typically write either in the morning or after work uh, i like to get some writing in believe it or not when i'm at the gym <laughs> so i have um the scrivener is what i use for drafting and i have it synced up with my phone as well so and they just do that through dropbox so it makes it really easy so it's funny, you'll see me at the gym, I'll be like on one of the exercise bikes around one of the treadmills, just like typing away while I walk or while I pedal. I also have a stationary bike at my house that has a desk built into it for when I want to get away from my desk because I work from home. So every now and then it's nice just to get moving. So I'll take my laptop, I'll unplug it uh, on my lunch break or early in the morning before I start my work day and I'll just put it on the desk and start pedaling and write. And it kind of just helps like get everything moving because I just feel like I'm active and it just... I feel like I got in the zone that way. Very cool. So when you're sitting down to write, what do you write in a stretch? What is your normal, like, I write for this amount of time and I get this many words done? I find I work best with like a sprint setup. So especially during like NaNoWriMo was what introduced me to it, where you just like set a timer for 20, 30 minutes and just whatever you spit out is what you get. So I find I can usually get in like 20, 30 minutes about like 500 words, give or take. So I will set a timer for myself and just go. And I usually try to do that for at least an hour at a time. That's very, very cool. I mean, the fact, uh, yeah, no, that's good. I know a lot of people that do that. I recommend doing that too. So you said you had other stuff you were working on. Is it pieces to the same story or a different storyline? Different stuff. I find that for myself between books it sometimes helps to give myself a little brain break, but my brain also never stops. So I don't know how much of a brain break that truly is. <laughs> um, but, you know, you get an idea here or there. So some of them are like completely different. Some of the books in River Peak Heroes, some of the themes can get a little heavier because um, they do also deal with some themes of like trauma and things like that. So like I've got like a little cute little rom-com idea that I just spit out like 10K words of here and there. Just when my brain was like, this is getting heavy. We need to relax. <laughs> so it's good to have that. I find so that way you don't get burnt out on the same thing too. If you're writing a series, just to have something else that you can kind of turn to that if you want to keep writing and you don't want to break your rhythm, but you also are like, oh my God, this is getting really heavy or I'm going to burn out on this series. Like just to give yourself something else. So that did way you, you can... Did you intend to do it as a series? For River Peak Heroes? Yes, I did. Um, from the get-go, I kind of knew it would. I think for me, a lot of it was a lot of the media that I consume are superhero franchises. And to me, it just makes the most sense for those because you've got this cast of characters. And I've also always been a really big fan of the romance novels where each book is like a different couple and that focuses on a different couple. So that's what I've done with this one. So a character that you might meet in book one ends up being the love interest in book two with a different character. I always love when they do that because then you still get your happily ever after with that first couple but then you can also see how the story progresses and through different people's point of view. And for me too, with superheroes, one thing that I always thought was fascinating and I find a little lacking in a lot of superhero media is it's always told from the perspective of either the hero or the villain. And we always joke whenever we watch like these movies or these TV shows or read a comic, like, you know, there's all this like destruction that happens. And it's like, what, what about like the people that are just like living their normal life and they get impacted by these superheroes? Like, what happens to them? So that was something I wanted to kind of focus on was the hero is not the main character. His love interest is, right? So it's like if you took Spider Spider-Man and said, well, screw him. What's it like from Mary Jane's perspective? Or, okay, well, what about his sidekick's perspective? What happens to him? What about the villain's perspective and things like that, which you get a little bit, but it's something that I wanted to explore a little bit more just to make it a kind of a new, fresh twist on the genre. So it's not just the same thing over and over again. I'm glad you said that because one of the things that I realized is, and I'm not saying I haven't read every single romance out there. So before I get hate mail for saying this, <laughs> I always have to preface when I'm going to piss off yep. people, is um, having the same love interest carry on through a series, even if like it's focused around that one series, if you make it a pivotal component of the series, I think it gets stale. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that it's very hard to, you know, it's great that they're still in love and it's great if you can kind of hear about them and check in on your little heroes that you want. But if it's all about them, then you're, it gets boring pretty quickly. 
It's like you know? when you watch a TV show and they have that will they, won't they, and then the couple finally gets together and you're like, well, this show sucks now. <laughs> like, it's kind of a very similar concept. I feel similarly. Oh, moonlighting. Oh, yeah. That's one. Northern um, Exposure. Oh, man, there was a ton of those. Back oh, in the yeah. Day. So I'm dating myself there. That's like if I brought up a Remington Steel reference, we'd all just go, <laughs> okay, yeah, you're the ancient one. Uh, but all right, so Jessica, what are you... You know, you, you've, you've talked a lot of Spider-Man. What are your superhero influences? So my favorite is actually Daredevil and Matt Murdock. And I love <laughs> Kingpin and the Sinister Six for the villains. I'm a more of a Marvel person than I am DC. But on the DC side, I do um, really like Batman. I thought the Robert Pattinson Batman movie was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I thought Robert Pattinson killed it. And I loved what they did with the Riddler and how they modernized him. Um, so I'm a big fan of them. I really like, um, I know a lot of people don't like this show, but I really like the Titans show on DC. Oh. Um, I just, I like the Teen Titans and I like the Bat Fam on that end. I've always been more of a fan of that like street level superhero, just because you get a little more of those interpersonal connections with their community. Whereas, you know, as much as you know, fun the Avengers are and everybody loves Captain America, he's a favorite of mine as well. But, you know, after a while, you're like, okay, we get it. Like, you saved New York City, you know, which is another thing that I looked at, too, is I set my story in this, like, it's a fictional one, but it's, like, tiny little Colorado mountain town. Because I was like, all these superhero stories take place in New York, San Francisco, or a fictionalized version of New York. <laughs> so. Excellent. I think that the, what, so, since Toby got you started down this path, what did you think of the most recent Spider-Man movie? Oh, I loved it. I love seeing them all come together. I know a lot of it was kind of fan servicey, but I still thought it was really well done. I actually think it's probably one of my favorite in the entire universes. I think it was so well done. Yeah. The way they introduced the multiverse, I think, made it so everybody could kind of understand it. Like, yeah. truly understand it that way. And I thought it was brilliant. I cried. There are a couple oh, yeah. times we I all cried. Did. We all did. Plus, I think they redeemed Andrew Garfield in that because i loved him as spider-man too which i know is another controversial opinion in the superhero realm with superhero media um but i did i loved him as spider-man even though he wasn't like my original one i thought he did a great job and i know everyone's like oh peter parker's supposed to be this like he's, he was too cool to be him but no, peter parker got his moments too you know where he can be he's like the cool nerd so i thought andrew did a good job with that and it was nice to see him kind of have his full circle moment with mj with gwen so yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Okay. Mark, did you have something? You look like you had something. Sorry. I did. I do. I have another one. Uh, you know, you mentioned Batman. You mentioned, uh, you know, Cap as a favorite. So, uh, you know, that is the ultimate question. Who wins in a fight, Captain America or Batman? Oh, I mean, that's tricky. But I think ultimately, I think Cap might take it just because he's got that super soldier serum. You know, as impressive as Bruce Wayne is, he's running on money and trauma. And that'll only take you so far so well no. you know it's interesting too is it's which which version of them that too mm -hmm. time period because i yeah. think that makes a huge difference mm -hmm. because you know you could go i haven't actually seen the robert pattinson batman yet because i started to watch it but for whatever reason my tvs are super dark like i've turned up the brightness and that entire movie is like in oh, the yeah. dark with the 20 watt pole so is. i was like I need to go to somebody's house who has a better TV for me. I, I literally sat 20 minutes in going, I can't see anything. It was kind of like watching the new um, House of Dragon series, which That's also dark, was too. like 90% dark the entire time. It's, well, well, it's, uh, everything is so dark these days. My, my only complaint about the Batman movie was that it was shot slow motion for absolutely every shot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's why it's three and a half hour runtime. But if you took out all the slow motion it would be 27 minutes there were uh, but, a few moments where we were like why is this slow motion? <laughs> every moment it's like every scene without dialogue was considered for slow-mo but you know even the dialogue scenes let's throw some slow-mo in no one's gonna care uh but um no all right so all right so then you know you've got pads that you're talking toby for spidey uh you know who's your favorite batman oh it's got, actually robert pattinson is my favorite batman oh, there you i go. do I, I know i uh a few of the past ones I thought were a little, I don't know what the right word is. I want to say dry, but I feel like a lot of the past ones, 
it's and it could have been a director decision too they focus more on like i'm batman i'm rich when i liked robert pattinson like you see how unhinged he is like this is a guy that desperately needs therapy and instead is just using his money to beat up you know the the crime lords of his city yes so i like that they kind of tapped into that a little bit more and you got to see him be a little bit more kind of unhinged like, you know a friend of mine and i joke like no like batman is emo like lean into it more media you cowards and they did so i was thrilled <laughs> You don't think uh, Affleck's Batman was pretty emo? I thought he was good, but I don't know. Roberts was, they leaned into it. I wouldn't know because I cannot watch it because I cannot yeah. see anything of it. I also cannot <laughs> watch the lights like off and everything. And I'm like, this is so dark. Yeah. I also yeah. can't watch the Justice League movies without riffing them mystery science theater style. Heck the yeah. only way I can sit through them. So. Yeah, they were. <laughs> Again, slow motion for slow motion. You know. hmm. What about the new one that he redid? What were your thoughts? Did you watch it? I did. So a little funny story. So my husband has, uh, with his friend group, before I met him, they all went out to see it. And one of their friends did not want to go. They're like, guys, no, these all suck. I'm not going. They're like, come on, like, just join us. Like, it won't be that bad. And he's like, you guys, I swear to God, if we go to this movie and it sucks, I'm never talking to you again. And it sucked and he literally never talked to them again. <laughs> <laughs> so when wow. they did the remastered the recut my husband is anthony anthony's like we have to we have to watch it like and we have um hbo which i think is what it's on so he's like we have to watch it like i have to try it i need to see if it redeems it and i was like okay <laughs> um, and again could not sit through it without riffing it mystery science theater style it's needed to be true. done <laughs> i thought it was at least better than the first one it it did have its improvements it did. I'll you know, that. I think part of the problem with that entire thing, we're going off on such a tangent here, but Sorry. we really get, you know, super, let's talk to super nerds, but I think one of the biggest things and the problem, like, I actually like the Suicide Squad movie, the first one, and a lot of people said they didn't like it. I thought it could have been better because it was very campy and I was like, I, I get it, but I don't. But then I saw a whole thing where Deadpool had just come out and because i don't know if you guys remember they made them go reshoot a bunch of that movie yep, right turned it from a serious to a comedy yeah. exactly so they took something that was supposed to be really dark and made it super campy mm -hmm. and i went you know it didn't like the bad guy all this stuff doesn't work if you're trying to be campy you have to pick a campy bad guy and mm -hmm. she is not a campy bad guy right even in the comics she wasn't a campy bad guy she was a really harmful bad guy and so I, I went, you know, it sucks as a director, and now this has happened to him several times, where they take the movie and he goes, okay, here's the movie um, that uh, he, you know, they, he wants to make and they go, no, what we want you to do is this, because I remember watching Suicide Squad and thinking, this is like a lot of the funny parts, but you could see where the people doing the characters, especially some parts, were so um, uh, serious, like yeah, the whole Joker really Harley funny. thing, you know? And I don't think they reshot anything having to do with the Joker. So he's this serious, and then they cut all the scenes that actually showed how batshit crazy Harley was, Yeah, right? Yeah, they definitely had like an identity crisis, I feel like. The new one that they did though with James Gunn, I thought was excellent. The oh. new Suicide Squad? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Peacemaker was a great follow-up too. So yes. <laughs> I was pissed off because I felt like they burned through too many characters. Oh, that was the joke. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. I love yeah. that as a joke. I I did. They got rid of Nathan Fillion. Oh, he's not dead. You never see him die. So. Michael Roker. Like, dude, yeah. he's super dead. His face is missing. No, it's a superhero franchise. Nobody ever died. Nobody did. I mean, even Weasel showed back up at the end. Come on. <laughs> yeah no one ever really dies spoiler yeah but uh no all right so you're superheroes uh yeah and you've done world building what are you know and you're talking about like small towns are there power yeah. limits in your world are there you know what how do they work yeah so the way that it functions is so basically with the world building here is um and it kind of goes a little into the premise so we've got our superhero character his name is kane his identity is hematite uh, named after the stone um and how he gets that name is in the book so i won't spoil that for anybody but 
basically the way it works is there's this crime ring that operates in their small town. And I got the idea for it because I grew up in a small town and a lot of shit goes down in small towns that gets swept under the rug, right? They like to keep their crime rates nice and low, but everybody's kids are doing drugs and stealing out of the, the wine cabinet, right? So and that's kind of where the idea, come, idea came from. So basically what happens is there's this drug that circulates around their town. And basically if you take it and you're pregnant, your baby's gonna come out with superpowers. Um, so he's trying to figure out how he got his superpowers, what's going on and who's responsible for this drug so he can stop it because he views his powers as a curse. So he doesn't want other kids to grow up you know, with the hardships that he has. So everybody's power does have a little caveat to it. Everybody ends up with a different power. So it's going to vary from individual to individual. Like oh, that's pretty cool. Thanks. <laughs> um, I'm curious. So you're doing your release. Have you practiced your signature yet? I have. I actually am very excited because I have a few signed paperbacks on my website. And I already had a few people get some. So I have them ready to go in the mail. So have I you figured out the little catchphrase you're going to put. I haven't yet. I still need to come up with a good catchphrase. You need to come up with like three rotating catchphrases. I think I do. It's been nice because the two that have been ordered are people that I know. So I've been able to just put like a little inside joke. Um, but I do need a catchphrase. See, you're going to have to come up with some really cool ones that come out of your book. It's funny because we I this came up on a, a podcast and somebody was like, I never thought about that. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I like I always put I hope you um I hope you don't sleep well and stuff like that. That's what I put. Mine are all monster dad dad jokes. And that's you know, that's what I throw in mine. So yeah, so you have to because you're you got a whole series of superheroes, and then eventually somebody's gonna show up dressed as one of your superheroes. If that ever happens, I think I will like die on the spot. I would love that. I'm a cosplayer too. So if anybody cosplays from not my time, I will shit myself. <laughs> have you thought about cosplaying your own characters? I actually have. I had for Halloween, I put together some pieces for a hematite cosplay. And then it's actually really funny. We were walking, my husband and I were walking around Disney Springs and at Uniqlo, one of the mannequins had on this outfit that was like identical to hematite's like sidekick, who's the, the love interest in book two. And I was like, shut the fuck up. That's Elijah. Like the mannequin is Elijah. <laughs> so my husband actually went, he bought the outfit. Nice. I was like, you're too cute. And you're like the official first, not my time cosplayer. This is fantastic. Hey, we, well, see, we have... The best part is you, you do cons because we saw each other at Dragon Con. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so now he can dress up as one of your characters. Yep. He's yep. Like, Come meet That's... this character at the booth. Um, our good friend uh, Jackie Sonnenberg, that's her famous, you know, her character. She wears costumes as her characters and promotes it at cons. And that's how she, she's like, you just met a character, hands you a business card. It's a very there amazing thing she does. So, Yeah, it's it's actually really funny because she doesn't really like having a booth. She doesn't like being tied down. She wants to walk around with her like undead lambs and stuff like that. <laughs> Great horror, by the way. Yeah, she likes horror, yeah. <laughs> They're very terrifying costumes. What was what surprised you about the a publishing process? What has been a surprise to you? One thing that surprised me about the process, I would say the journey to get here was the most surprising. Um, so one reason I'm very, very grateful for my publisher for Horsemen is that I was given the opportunity to tell my story authentically because one of the themes of the story is actually post-traumatic stress disorder. So the main protagonist, her name is Rory. She has PTSD. I also have PTSD. So it was very important for me that that was included in the story. And when I was, you know, querying this novel, I got quite a few um, revise and resubmit requests. And the only change was editing out all the symptoms of Rory's PTSD. And I was like, wow, that's really shitty. <laughs> um, you know, I won't name any names. It's dust under the bridge, it's water under the bridge at this point. But um, I was very grateful for the opportunity to tell the story authentically, but I was very surprised at how much of a hurdle that was going to be. Wow. Well, I think that speaks volumes and not, you know, I talk about all the time that I'm a publisher, I'm Four Horsemen, you're one of our authors, but um, I, you know, that's one of the reasons we started it was because too often publishing companies and that's something major, but they have you change things like you, they'll get your manuscript, they'll sign you all up 
And then they'll go, oh, actually, we need you to switch the genders of the two lead characters. Yeah. Or we, you know, you're taking place in this little Colorado town, but we actually need you to move it to New York. Mm-hmm. Like, you'd be amazed how much that stuff happens. And it's horrible because that's not the story that you want to tell. Now, you know, zazzing up a story a little bit and a little help. And if there's a few, like if you say, you know, the word, um, you know, they 4,000 times, then we might have to clean that up because there's only so many times one must wink, nod, or shrug <laughs> during the book, you know, but um, you don't want somebody to go, this is great. Can you change this entire story? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's what shocked me too, is especially too, I did not submit anywhere that didn't disclaim, you know, we are interested in sharing stories from people who are from a marginalized group or our own voices story, whether it be, you know, your skin color or a mental health issue or a disability, you know, whatever it may be. I exclusively submitted to people that disclaimed that. And so I was very, very surprised at just like how big of a deal that was. I was like, oh, okay, interesting. <laughs> wow. That's, that's very interesting. Okay. So now your, your, your book's coming out. What are you the most excited for? Oh gosh, I am actually really excited to, I think, just get this out there in the world and just hopefully connect with people to the point of, you know, my main character having post-traumatic stress disorder. I hope that this can just help at least one person feel seen because she's not a war vet. And there's a big, you know, stigma around PTSD about, you know, if you weren't in the war, you're like, well, what do you have PTSD for? No, you don't. Like, well, it can cover anything that happens. It's traumatic. So I hope I can just help at least one person feel seen. So I'm excited for that opportunity. I cannot wait for somebody to tell you that because I know you're going to have that happen. Absolutely. Um, so Mark, I'm going to let you ask the final question, but I'm I'm going to come up. I have one, one on the zingers. Right. Um, uh, you po- This has been up. Have you gotten, you've gotten reviews so far, right? From people that you don't know, correct? On Goodreads and stuff? Have I? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so you're not stalking them. That's a good thing. I'm not, no. I also have, so I'm in a a Slack group for other 2023 debut authors. And they have in there a um, a link to a Google Chrome extension that is like a Goodreads review filter. So that way, if you're like me and you get like super anxiety, it will just like block that out. (laughs) so I I kind of have that turned on so well, don't start googling that's not what we no. need <laughs> no no we don't need I'm not sure if there have been any that have come through or not yet though since it comes out on Thursday but I have had people add it to their you know want to read list on Goodreads that I don't know so I was like oh there's people I don't know that are adding this okay <laughs> well and I also think you're hitting a market that is actually underserved quite a bit yep. you know um, and not just from the PTSD aspect, but the different kind of superheroes that are not mega superhero stories. I think that you're you have you have some secret formula that's going to be kind of epic. Stop googling your reviews. <laughs> I see you doing it. I can tell. Okay, because I only recommend people read reviews if it's something they can do for themselves. You know what I mean? And they feel very comfortable doing it, and not. Because reviews are really for readers. The time that I feel that they're good for authors is when um, you're a self-published author or something like that. And, you know, people talk about it. But I've seen the weirdest reviews in the entire world. It's great. They're an acknowledgement. But they're not the true acknowledgement. Because a lot of times the people that will be the most impacted by your book are not the people that are going to review or reach out to it. You know, they're the people who do this like weird kind of creepy thing at conventions where they'll like walk past your booth several times and like look at you and want to walk over and talk to you, but won't because they'll just be creepily walking back and forth. So those are the people you're going to have to go hi and pull them in because those are the people that when they you get them to talk will tell you how much your book has impacted them. So. Um, Mark, final question of the podcast. All right. So your 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 book hits big. You get optioned by a major studio, and it's going to be part of a fantastic franchise setting up the universe. Who plays your lead character, and why? In this book, 
Oh gosh, that's a really good question. So there is this TikTok actor, um, his name is Stuart Mackey, that when I was writing Not My Time, I was actually querying it. Um, my One of my best friends in the whole world, her name's Michelle, she sent me one of his videos and I was like, shut the fuck up. He looks so much like Kane in the face. And he's got the long blonde hair. I was like, if you straightened this guy's hair, he would look just like him. The only thing is he's Irish. Um, but I was like, hey, if he can drop the accent, put him in the movie. So. Oh, that's Excellent. exciting. I love it. I love it. Love it. Nice, nice twist. I like that. You have to get him to pose with one of your books. That would be kind of badass. You know, he does a lot of um, A Court of Thorns and Roses cosplay. So oh, I was like, hey, send him the book and let him cosplay Kane. Yep. <laughs> very, very cool. Okay. Well, shameless self-promotion time, my friend. Where can people find you and your book? Yeah, so I'm on probably every social media imaginable as author Jessica Selena, except for Twitter. It's just Jess underscore Selena. Or you can go to my website, jessicaselena.com. I've got all my links known to mankind all in there. Very cool. And the book is it's called Not My Time. I have a copy handy. Oh, so, hold it up. This. Yeah. <laughs> it's Not My Time, River Peak Heroes, book one. Very, awesome. very cool. Thank you so much for being on this podcast with us, Jessica. It's been awesome. Thank you for having me. This is my first podcast, actually. So this has been a blast. Woo! Woo! First time. Yeah. Here, <laughs> what do you need to cut your teeth on? <laughs> Ah, okay. No, this has been Drinking with Authors, guys. I've been your host, Erica Lance. My co-host has been the amazing Mark Monsey at Airy Travels. And um, don't forget to like, subscribe, leave us a review, leave us a comment. We love to hear about it. Um, and we will see you guys next time.